soon as you see these kids transition from junior tennis to pro, uh, sorry, to college tennis, I mean, it's night and day. When you first got into college coaching, was it everything that you expected it to be? Did you fall in love with it immediately? It was an unusual kind of situation. You know, I, I tell people this too. I was, I was being paid, there was a stipend to be the tennis coach. It was only $4,500. I'm very curious to get, you know, your philosophy on, on recruiting as a whole. What are the things that you look for to identify talent? It's really getting the guys with the right mindset that, you know, it's okay if you make a B plus. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 35 of Just Slap Podcast, the pound for pound number one tennis podcast in the game. Your host, Stephen Alex, and joined today by the legendary coach, Billy Pate. He is the coach at Princeton University and has over 27 se seasons of, of college coaching experience. Coach Pate, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to join you guys tonight, and I really appreciate you guys thinking of me and having me on. And I don't know about the legendary status. I'm, I'm far from that. <laughs> you guys are way too kind, but, uh, but uh, very nice of you to have me on. I'm excited to chat with you guys today. No, oh, no, thank you. Thank you. And, and, uh, and, and it, it means a lot, the fact that you're doing this uh, on a Saturday night when you could be doing a lot uh, better things <laughs> yeah. with your time. So, so we, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, just to kind of get into it, you know, you, you, you just kind of wrapped up on the 2022 season. So, you know, you guys went 18 for nine, um, four and three in conference matches. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, your, your 2022 season and, and where you see the program uh, heading into the next year. Yeah, it's great. We're, we're, we do have individuals left. So next week we'll be um, traveling to uh, Champaign, Illinois, which is the final side of the NCAA champion, Division One Championships this year. And uh, we do have a, a singles participant, our number one singles player. And then our, our doubles team, uh, we, we feel uh, pretty confident they're, they're going to be um, in the tournament. They're the first alternate. They're, they're ranked 32 in the country. There's 32 teams that get in. But of course, there's some conference uh, affiliations there. So we're hoping they get in. So we do continue our before we can even close the chapter uh, on the uh, on the year. It, uh, we've got another week or two, but we're excited. We had a great year. Um, you know, it was a little bit up and down, to be honest, though, with with COVID. Um, you know, as, and you know, we, we didn't play the previous year in the Ivy League. Um, but even coming back with with Omicron hitting in January, and and we have some very strict testing protocols um, in the Ivy League. It was it was pretty difficult. We missed a lot of. Uh, you know, we played the defending national champion. Uh, Florida Gators at their place in, um, in late January, early matchup and without three of our top six. So that was challenging. So we had a really tough schedule lined up already uh, coming off of COVID. And um, it was sort of our first foray into kind of managing all those protocols. Um, we had a lot of injuries too. I mean, I'm not making excuses. It sounds horrible, but my guys, uh, I think I'm a broken record, but we, we really managed well, actually. We, we faced a lot of adversity. The guys, did well considering, um, you know, we there were four Ivy teams that made uh, the NCAA tournament this year. That, I can believe that's the first um, in history of Ivy League tennis. So it just goes to show how deep the conference is, um, how great a competition we have um, in front of us, which is good. But we also scheduled very um, aggressively outside the league. So that really enabled us to, to um, make the tournament. So so all in all, we had a great year, all things considered. We certainly we had five seniors with us this year, which is a lot. And again, that was sort of a couple of guys that had took gap years to come back um, to spend their last year at Princeton uh, because of COVID. Um, so we, we, we were excited about what we did. Um, we felt like we maybe could have been better at times, but we had a great match last week with Arizona um at the uh, in, uh north carolina regional um it was a tough draw for us actually uh, arizona could have they made a strong statement to host they were the 16th ranked team so by virtue of that they could have very well been a, they should have been maybe a one seed and hosted so we had a kind of a challenging draw but we had a great match with them we we won the doubles we won four four first sets we kind of were in the i wouldn't say driver's seat but we certainly had control of that match for a while but uh, arizona did a great job they're experienced like we are too they didn't panic they, they rallied back and so they they won a close match and ended our season, but uh, the regular team season. But it was it was a great year uh, all in all, and we're we're excited about the future. Yeah. What what was it like competing against these tough schools? I mean, considering the fact that you had you weren't able to compete as much as as a bunch of these other schools, considering the Ivy Leagues weren't allowed to compete uh, for for so much time during COVID specifically. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we we had a lot of our guys playing. And as, as you know, when when COVID hit a lot, a lot shut down. But but starting that summer, even there right in, in 2020, there were 
a lot of, um, and we didn't know at that juncture we weren't going to have a, a season, but um, it ended up, I think, by November. It was when the Ivy Leagues announced that we wouldn't play um, intercollegiate athletics in the Ivy League that year. And um, so we had guys do different things, um, but we, most of all, our key guys were playing a lot. In fact, our number one guy who's is playing next week in Champaign, um, Ryan Sagerman, he, um, I think he played over 125 competitive matches in that year. You know, if you go and look on UTR and what he did, I mean, he was playing every week. He, of course, he's fortunate. He lives out in um, SoCal and he, he's very close. He's in San Diego. He's about an hour south of where in Newport Beach, they've had a ton of um, really good, um, you know, 25K UTRs. And so he was playing almost every week and he was playing all different kind of events and, and traveled to quite a few as well. So I give him credit. He and Will Peters, uh, one of our other um, uh, upperclassmen that was with him a lot of the time they played. Um, several other guys played a lot. So, yeah, that was the key is just, in, you know, that's the advice for anybody is just to continue to compete, you know, because I, 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 don't, I don't think we were too rusty because we did have the fall. We came back in a, a pretty normal fall before Omicron hit. So we, we certainly got our reps. And I, I think it, it felt pretty normal until Omicron kind of hit um, again in January. And I think for everybody, it was a little bit of a challenge. But then we seem to kind of got in a good space, you know, with the pandemic again, hopefully knock on wood. And, and um, you know, we don't want to go through that again, but hopefully we're, we're looking in, a, you know, in a positive direction now. Yeah. And, 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 you know, just, just to kind of highlight, I mean, you guys were ranked as high as 18th, right. And in, uh, uh, in 2020 before, before COVID struck. And, and so you guys were kind of, you know, making higher highs uh, during that season. And, and, uh, and, you know, obviously ultimately had to, had to have the season cut short. I mean, we know plenty about that as well, because our season got cut. I was, that was my senior year, which was, was quite unfortunate, but um but yeah, very happy to hear that that uh, that, that you guys are you know uh, picking picking it back up. Um, so a, a question that I have is more so, you know, going back to because you are our guest today, and you know we really want to get into your career as a college coach. You know, we mentioned twenty seven you know seasons as a college coach. You know, ten as the head coach at Princeton, ten as the head coach uh, at Alabama, um, two years uh, as an assistant at Notre Dame. At you know, so you you definitely have a lot of experience coaching. So I guess my first question would be like, how did you enter the world uh, of of coaching college tennis, and and what made you want to do that? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Steve. A lot of people have asked, and and honestly, I I, I tell everyone that I didn't set out to be a college coach initially. Um, I, in fact, I remember I, I've said this many times. I I probably uh, had too much fun in college. You know, I was very social. I was, I was a rush chairman in our fraternity. I was I did too much as my uh, old college coach, probably you know Andy Jackson would tell you. You know, but but I I did. I did enjoy the experience. I did enjoy playing, but I, I remember being in a bar in, in college and, and a guy asked me, you know, a friend, what, Hey, what are you going to do when you graduate? Um, which is a kind of a normal thing. And, and I said, well, I, I you know, I really want to be a, a major college athletics director. And he said, well, you know, there's, and again, this is probably 1990. So it's a long time ago, but there it's like, well, you know, there's master's programs for that. And, you know, that was really the start of, you know, which is kind of commonplace now, but to, to study a sport as a, as a discipline, you know, as for, to get a graduate degree in sports management, sports administration. Um, I'm like, and I, I was kind of new to that and it was a lot, the internet wasn't really going at the time. And, and so, um, you know, I researched it and I ended up at Georgia state in Atlanta and the Olympics were on the way in 96. So a lot of people were, there were sort of fledgling uh, people that wanted to work in the sports industry were, were going there. And so I had my sights set on that or working in professional sports, maybe, perhaps being an, an agent working for IMG at the time, I actually, there was a time where I had maybe some opportunities at ProServe, which was one of the original um, agencies in tennis. And um, so I would have maybe gone to that track as well. Um, but I kind of sort of, I, I did a lot of different things. I even interned with Atlanta Braves for a short time. I um, worked with world team tennis in Atlanta. I was a, kind of the PR person there. Um, you know, but I kind of got my being in Atlanta was a great, tennis town and I stopped playing. I started playing again. And then I had this opportunity where I was a sports formation director at this junior college and they asked me to be the coach. And I thought it would be a short term deal. Uh, I got my master's and could teach in the junior college. So all of a sudden I just started coaching this team and realizing we could be very competitive nationally and probably win the national title. So I was there five years and 
um, again, probably thinking I would just do this as a transition. And um, by year three, we won a national title. So my last three years, we won the national title. It was, it was great. We had incredible team, uh, great players. Atlanta was a great place to, to live and to work. Um, it was a very vibrant scene to play tennis. You know, a lot of us, we had a pro league there. So I got involved in a lot of different areas. I was, I was a director at a club while doing the, the college, uh, teaching at the college, I was running in a lot of different directions. So at that point, after about five years of that, having some success, I said, you know, I really think I want to just do this college coaching thing full time, like where it's just directed toward, you know, the best experience we can give the athlete. So that means I would either, unless it's like a Georgia Tech or Georgia State, I'd probably have to leave Atlanta. And so Bobby Bayless was a, a friend of mine, sort of a mentor. Um, it was a long time truly legendary status at Notre Dame and, um, you know, probably the most popular coach in the country. And uh, I connected with Bobby. He had an opening um, and he invited me to be the coach at Notre Dame. And, and I thought it was a real it's kind of an outside the box thing at the time. I, I really kind of lived in the South and um, but I jumped at the opportunity. I thought living in South Bend and, and working with Bobby and, and being in a different environment was great. And I tell all young coaches getting into it, you know, go geographically, go anywhere expose yourself to different people, different coaches, different, uh, you know, um, influences in your life. And, and that was really a turning point for me, I think. And I, I realized at that point I wanted to do it, you know, long term. And so I stayed with it and, um, you know, I had some opportunities after the, the first year of there even. And then the second year I had some some job opportunities and, and Alabama offered. So I took that job. But it, it that's kind of stayed on that path, but um, I, I think maybe I could go back the other way in administration. But now with all the issues in college athletics, I, I'm kind of happy I coach and just kind of have control over my team. And it's been it's been a fun ride, and I want to I want to keep it going. No, that's that's amazing. And how how uh, when when you first got into college coaching, was it everything that you expected it to be? Like, did you? did you fall in love with it immediately? Cause I, I know some people who have gone into it and they're like, this is, this is just a completely different world. Uh, you know, it's not like coaching reg, like it's not like coaching individuals. So did you have that experience when you, when you first got into it? I don't know if it was a love at first sight because there were so many, it, it was an unusual kind of situation. You know, I, 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 I tell people this too. I was, I was, being paid, there was a stipend to be the tennis coach. It was only forty five hundred dollars, you know, to to do it. You know, and when 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 young up and coming coaches complain about salaries and they're making a, a good salary, I remind them of this, you know. But um, and I was still putting maybe forty hours a week toward toward that program. Um, and but you know, I I get a lot of international guys because a lot of the guys going to junior college maybe they just couldn't get into the Division One, but we were getting incredible players. And then I kept those relationships going with the SEC schools, the ACC schools, because they recruit the guys at junior college because they would have to transfer after two years. But, I mean, I would just show up at the airport in Atlanta, pick a guy up, trying to find housing for him. I'm, like, helping him get a lease. And and because we didn't really have dorms on campus. It was a commuter college and um, maybe helping with jobs off campus. So it was more of a mentoring thing. than a, And then I, I think I fell in love with that aspect of it is working with people helping kids, you know, I was teaching class, teaching, um, in the PE department there. So that was, that was pretty fun. Um, but I, I, then as we started to have success and we started to get really good players, I I said, you know, this is really great. So then I think I did fall in love with it. And, and I, I think it kind of helped because I was teaching a lot of, um, the ladies leagues in Atlanta to make money and, you know, that the stuff that, you know, kind of goes on there and, you know, I was like, you know, I, I, I think I'd rather be coaching the elite level guys. So, it kind of made you more hungry for that. So I think that sort of helped as well. No, absolutely. And so I'm, 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 I'm curious. I, you know, you obviously have experience, like we said, you coached 10 years at Alabama and then now you've, you've moved into, I mean, for the last 10 years, you've moved into Ivy league tennis and specifically at Princeton. What, I mean, those are from an outsider's perspective, those are two vastly different schools. I mean, uh, polar opposites almost, I feel um, so can you talk about the pros and cons, I guess, of, of coaching or, or your experience in Ivy League uh, tennis, specifically Princeton, um, relative to your experience in Alabama and in Notre Dame as an assistant? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, both are incredible experiences um, in their own right. You know, you, they're, they're similar more than you would think from a standpoint of both are 
have a very big brand. You know, I'm Alabama, obviously, maybe more it's known from an athletic brand, I mean, especially what football has done. But, but I mean, and they're, and they're, they're a good academic school, too. Obviously, there, there's a lot of great programs there. And then Princeton's just, you know, one of the most elite academic universities in the world. It's got a very huge global uh, recognition, um, no doubt about it. So they are different from that standpoint, um, you know, but I, I think being at Notre Dame sort of paved the way for me to, to be here. I, I, when I took the Notre Dame assistant job, I, and I was going from junior college, which maybe doesn't have the best academic reputation, maybe, um, you know, I, I always said, well, if I ever want an Ivy league job, I probably need to kind of have this experience with, because Notre Dame is a, an incredible academic institution as well as a great ac- athletic program. But um, so that, that experience, I think paved the way for me thinking about that. Um, and even at Alabama, I was always, I really liked the, the, the smarter guys, the, the kids were serious about um, academics. I, the president at the time of Alabama, he's a great guy and he really grew the university he would meet with our recruits and I would have them meet and he would really want to talk about the academic programs, the honors college, things like that. So I had a fascination. I was sort of, I'm certainly not an intellectual, but I was becoming a quasi intellectual, I guess. I really, I really um, sort of started leaning that way. And um, I really admired the, the Ivy league. And, and of course the, at the same time, you know, I think, and it, you guys know this, but there's every, every school is different. The scholarship schools, we don't offer athletic scholarships in the Ivy. Of course I knew that, but, but, the um, scholarship schools, everybody's 4.5 scholarships for the men's side is very different. It depends on what your school costs, what kind of in-state out of state advantage you have, whether you have like Georgia, Florida, and some of the other Southern states have lottery scholarships. Um, there's academic scholarships. There's, there's out of state, in-state waivers, wh- whatever it may be. There's, there's different. And it's like having a professional team and a salary cap. And how, how do you manage that? You know, if you lose one player that's on 80%, how do you replace it? Well, with the Ivy leagues, of course, it's, you don't really worry about that. Granted, we don't offer athletic scholarships, but the financial aid has continued to get better and better. And so when I started 10 years ago, it was it was very good at the time. And I think it's even improved since then. Um, and, and that's a big thing. So when people worry about paying for an Ivy League education, they're very generous with that. So um, so those are differences. But um, and then you have a little bit more maybe a serious student, clearly. Um, in the Ivy League, you have to have a lot of success going in to be admitted. Um, and, and the rigor of what you do while you're in school clearly is, is challenging from a time perspective. But see, I think it's, it's actually helpful because, and parents love it, um, because, you know, the, the kids really, they come to college to play. If they're playing a sport, they're, they're playing a sport and they're, they're playing, um, they're, they're focusing on their academics. And obviously there's a social life component. Um, but it's, it's, they really have to manage that time. So I don't really have to worry too much and knock on wood about our guys at Princeton. I, obviously some of the guys I've had before, maybe I've had to worry, you know, at Alabama or the junior college and, and even my guys at Notre Dame, you worry about them, you know, doing the right thing, making the right decisions. Um, so I think that's, that's one factor. And I think the, the, the biggest thing, and the, one of the advantages is just the people you meet. I mean, the guys, you know, I went to, a, they, they're very generous. They invite us to classes. You know, we, I, I attended a, I attended a uh, political history class a few weeks ago. It was very interesting. I went to three lectures and you have that opportunity at a place like Princeton. Not, not that you don't at Alabama, but I think you get, you have some, the, the professor is on CNN quite often and some of the political talk shows. And it's just great to hear it from the source. And um, so our students are, um, you know, get that access. And, um, and even as a coach, you get that access a little bit. So I think it's great just to be around these, these serious minds and, and you get to follow these kids and what they do in their career. And they're going to do some sensational things. And some of the alums, we have reunions coming up this next weekend and many of our alums will come back and get to connect. We have actually a mentoring call with our um, athletes tomorrow. So getting a job for them is very important. And, and that's not to take away from the fact they can certainly uh, try, you know, to play on the tour. We want them to do that. But but if not, there, there's all these resources and this great um, uh, network. And and Alabama has that too. Notre Dame has that. But but I think it's pretty special here. And, and obviously the, getting the job and having success uh, right after college is very important in this uh, particular situation. And, and another, you know, if I may, Alex, uh, you know, obviously 
the Ivy League has always had, you know, great programs when it comes to tennis. Um, but I feel like recently in the last few years, it's it's gotten even better to the point where you have teams in the top 10, top 20. What do you think are some of those factors, you know, that that have led to the to the to the increased recent success uh, as a conference? Yeah. And so when I actually made the move 10 years ago from Alabama, this is a conversation I, I was having a lot beforehand, a few years before that. I, I was I always had my eye on the Ivies. I, I just saw it as something that was blossoming and was about to take off. And uh, I'd like to say I predicted this, um, but but I, I don't know that I necessarily did. But it, at, at this level, but I would talk to um, Coach Fish, who was a longtime coach at Harvard, just retired a few years ago. Um, and we were on a lot of, we served in a lot of committees and the ITA board together. And, you know, I remember having discussions with him and David Benjamin, of course, who ran the ITA, who was a longtime Princeton coach. And I really picked their brain and asked them if they would just be crazy if I made this move from the SEC to the Ivy and, um, and things were changing. There were, um, there were being a lo lot more, um, you know, the Ivy league as a whole was trying to be a little more aggressive towards winning and be having more success across the board in athletics. Um, the financial aid I mentioned had started to really improve at all eight Ivy League institutions. A lot of coaches were older coaches were retiring. Some new ones were coming in. So there were some very good coaching changes that were. So now you have on um, the men's side, it's just really competitive. I mean, I got to say, I think I, I don't know another sport in the Ivy League that that compared to men's tennis is more successful across the board and more deep, um, you know, at that at that, you know, level nationally. So. So, yeah, it's just it's really changed. Like you said, um, you know, it really, Steve, it's like the last few years have even gotten better. Um, I think another component of that is I tell people all the time, there's a lot of smart tennis kids like like I think most tennis kids around the globe. And, you know, maybe sometimes if English isn't their first language, maybe it's tough to make the TOEFL or the SAT. You have to take it in English to to be admitted to a place like Princeton. But um, nonetheless, I mean, I, I don't know many tennis players that aren't really smart or intellectually very capable if they were to get into Princeton to do the work. So we, we get to choose from a lot of different guys. It's not as selective as it, it's still selective, obviously, but I think there's more players globally that have access to the Ivy Leagues and then they know about it more. Now that we've had success, you sort of build on that success. Uh, again, compared with the, um, you know, the financial aid. And I, I think, too, when I look back, when I went to um, college, you know, back in that era, everybody just told you, go to college, get a degree, which is good advice. But now it's almost like everybody has to get a better degree and that there's a lot of pressure for a lot of kids to get a better degree. So there's a lot of competition, but um, it's all good. It's all means that um, things are really competitive in the Ivy Leagues for, for tennis and a lot of other sports. Do you, so correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, I, the way it works in the Ivy Leagues is, and, and this happens at a lot of different schools, not just in the Ivy Leagues, um, but a coach has a specific number of spots that they're able to allocate to players when they're recruiting. And from what I understood, from what I understand, the reason why Columbia has had so much success specifically in the last uh, few years is because they have more spots that they're able to fill when it comes to uh, a recruit coming in in, in terms of like recruiting a player. Um, so there isn't like that academic, uh, academic uh, standard um, as let's say compared to, you know, Princeton or compared to UPenn. Uh, is that something that's changing in the Ivy leagues? Like, is that a new thing for Columbia or is that, am I completely wrong when I'm saying this, but that's something that I've heard about um, which, you know, the reason why sometimes, other Ivy Leagues aren't able to go, you know, improve as much or, or perform as well as some of these major schools um, like, you know, the, the, the schools like Florida, for example. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think in general, um, I would say in a broad sense, um, you know, each Ivy League in, institution for, for men's tennis would have roughly around three on average per year that you could, the coach could list for admissions. Uh, and, and that's, and as you know, that's really the really gold because, you know, otherwise if you're just recruiting, you know, athletes uh, or non-athletes that they have to get in without your support, it's going to be really challenging. It's, it's really difficult. So, 
So that's kind of the key. You list these players. And, and I don't know that certain universities have more. Maybe they have, let's say, four in given year, uh, a given year. Uh, maybe I don't know that anybody really gets five. Um, maybe they're more flexible with that. Uh, there are, you know, every institution, you know, in the Ivy has different standards of what that score can be that they're uh, evaluating. Um, obviously, Princeton's pretty challenging. You know, our, mm. our uh, the, what we're requiring from, we go by this, um, something called an academic index. Our score is pretty high that we have to average. So, and you can, the more spots you have, obviously the better in terms of if you can, if you're allowed to average that. Um, you know, so if you were to have four versus three or three versus two, it's a lot better because maybe there's a guy that's just on the fringe and he can get some help by the other people in mm. the class, if that makes sense. So it does work uh, at many institutions within Ivy like that. Um, but um, yeah, but I will say, you know, compared to like I, if I were still at Alabama, where if you on a good year, if you have maybe enough scholarship for two good players, maybe you have 1.3 of your four left, that may be a general, you know, an average of what you might have on a given year, right? Um, so that's like two players on 65%. Well, you know, if I get, if I have happen to have three spots in the Ivy one year and, and scholarship doesn't really matter, it's almost like I can get more players than we can be deep. Mm. So, and that's the thing with scholarship school, especially with men's tennis, like if there's four and a half, by the time you get to your number seven or eight guy, you know, a lot of those guys are going to end up being walk-ons because they don't have, um, they're not getting scholarships. So right. we can get three, we'll, we'll actually can be deeper. So our 10 or 11 guy in the Ivy, so you can almost run the risk of getting too much of a good thing. So you wouldn't want too many spots because if you had four a year, that's a, you, you would average 16 on the team and that that's probably too many. And you got a lot of unhappy guys, right? So, um, so it's sort of a, you know, can be too good of a situation in a way, but I think it's pretty fair what we have. I know it's different a little bit. There's some nuances between each individual institution and what each coach may have or not have in a given year and what their require requirements are for admissions. But, um, and that, that's pretty fluid too. It can, it can change a little bit. Um, but no, I, I think it's a great system for us, um, particularly not having to worry about aid and let's say, you come in on a 20% scholarship at a, you know, a, another program, a scholarship school, and then you really set the world on fire. Well, I'm going to be compelled as a coach to, you know, improve your scholarship and as I should. Um, but let's say you come on 80% and you really aren't having the success you thought. And you know, that coach probably feels some pressure to, to move your money down and try to bring somebody else in. So that's kind of something we don't fortunately have to worry about, which I think is great. And, no, and for sure. Cook. Coach Pete, you know, since we're on the topic of recruiting, you know, obviously Princeton, you know, you probably get hundreds of emails a day from from potential recruits that want to come play at your school. So I'm, I'm very curious to get, you know, your philosophy on on recruiting as a whole um, and, and sort of what are the things that you look for to identify talent? Is it simply just, you know, they're, they're you know. Obviously, you have to be at the, the level and the caliber to, 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 you know, to be a fit for the team. But what are some of the other things that you look for and how has that changed, you know, throughout your years and experiences at different programs? Yeah, I, I think all coaches look for competitive athletes and, and tennis. Like if you're if you're really a top program, a national program, which we we like to think we are, we're competing with the best of the best. then then you want guys out there that are really great competitors that love to play tournaments. And, um, you know, I think one thing we, all of these high level academic schools are looking for, you know, with, with the competitive nature of people trying to, to get in and access these universities is you want to sort of vet that process and make sure they're not just trying to leverage their tennis ranking or rating, whatever it is, just to get in. And then maybe, especially with no scholarship now, they just decide, ah, I don't really want this anymore, you know? So, and there's nothing I can do about it. So we want to make sure they're very genuine about their approach to, and their passion for playing tennis. Um, so really our, our sort of, I think, recruiting philosophy, and I think this is across the board in the Ivy, like a lot of school, you're seeing more international um, athletes gaining access to the, to the Ivies. I mean, obviously there's a lot of Americans know about the Ivies. Um, they, they have the, a lot of them have the academics growing up. But, um, yeah, we're simply just trying to get the best tennis player who can get, you know, be admitted and have that and have success, obviously, while they're here. And, and we do feel, and I always say this, I think the, 
the admissions directors have really hard jobs at these elite academic institutions. But I, I do think when they admit somebody, I think they they typically do well. They, they find their way. You're, you're surrounded by great um, students, if you think about it. I mean, everybody's a great student. So it, it's really getting the guys with the right mindset that, you know, it's OK if you make a B plus, you know, it's not not the worst thing in the world. And, and yeah, there's going to be guys on campus and, and young ladies on campus that you're going to learn from and grow. And that, that's the best attitude. I was always Bobby uh, Bayless, you know, who I work for, you know, he he actually before going to Notre Dame, he was at MIT and he always told the story when he left MIT to go to Notre Dame. He said he got tired of being the dumbest guy in the bus, you know, as a joke. And um, yeah, you, you are surrounded by a lot of smart people and you get to learn, you know, I, I can learn from, from our, our student athletes. And so that's really cool. But, but in general, like, I think every coach is looking for that competitive streak and a player who has the best, you know, intentions of really trying to be the best they can be after college. You know, we want, I, I argue that if you get an Ivy league education, yeah, you, you could be set in terms of the opportunities you might have from a, with a job or, or what you're going to do in life. But, but why not try the professional circuit then because you have this powerful degree and this great network and alumni base, you know, then that's a great time to go out and, and play. And that's what some of our guys have done. And in fact, it's been a very challenging four years for a lot of guys, you know, they're sort of like need the breather and the breather might be go play, started playing futures and play challengers for two years. We've had several guys do that with knowing that they might not make, the grand slams, but they want the experience of seeing the world, make more connections and take sort of a breather and, and, and also get everything they can out of their tennis career. And so that's been another thing we've seen a lot of these guys do. So, so we kind of want that. Um, and we, we, when we do get these emails or we get contacted by recruits, we try to let them know that this is a very serious thing. And a lot of, a lot of the guys we get weren't even thinking about Ivy league tennis. They were, they were more or less thinking, you know, a lot of different schools and then, we're able to, they, they can see maybe they can be admitted and then not be fearful that they won't have success here academically. They will, if they, if they are admitted, we think um, there's a lot of, there's a great support system. So that's sort of our recruiting approach. It's really to focus on the, the best tennis player um, who's super competitive, who wants the high, has the highest ambition, but also can be admitted. Do you do you ever have to vet? So uh, let's say you have an individual who applies to the school or who is trying to be recruited, who is good enough at tennis, who has the academics. But have you ever had uh, experiences where you felt like the person just wouldn't fit in? Uh, like maybe he is too high of an achiever where the, the Ivy League culture would be toxic in, in a way um, where, you know, because it is. I can imagine. I can only imagine it's a very. It can be a very stressful environment considering the the rigorous academics with, combined with the athletics. Um, so, uh, do you ever? How do you vet personality or or fitting in with the team and with the school? Yeah, that's a really good question, and you hit on something that I think is um, important. I think a lot of kids who have been raised or grown up in an atmosphere where they've never had any failure whatsoever. They, they and, and this is probably speaks a little bit more to a lot of the kids who are sensational and get in on their own that aren't athletes and they're competing against the best of the best. Um, and they haven't had any kind of failure. I, I think that's challenging. We've had a couple of guys like that and the higher you can see it with their SAT scores and their um, what they've done in, in high school and all the other you know extracurricular activities. And they're still really good tennis players, but I, I, they're trying to compete at Princeton and it's really challenging. Um, so it's a mindset thing. Um, a great example is one of our top players, Carl Poling, and, you know, he's, he's graduating for us. He, he's actually using, because we can't do graduate school and play sports in the Ivy, it's unfortunate. That's probably our biggest frustration with the, the whole pandemic. And as it relates to our team, you know, besides not playing last year is like losing our players to go play elsewhere. He's, He's going to go to uh, UNC uh, next year and play, and he'll start an MBA program there. And he still has eligibility, which is great for him. But he's a guy that when we recruited him, and by the way, he grew up on the Army campus. His dad's been the longtime Army coach, just retired this year. Um, so he kind of saw discipline. But Carl wasn't a guy that I think he was looking at several schools when we pick. I mean, he did look at Harvard. He looked at Stanford. But he, but he also, I think it kind of came down to between us and South Carolina and Clemson. So he sort of had a broad range of schools and, and Carl wouldn't be the guy that in terms of his SAT scores or 
his um, GPA was was excellent, but it but wouldn't necessarily dictate that he's going to have incredible success academically. For instance, well, he just got our senior academic award um, this past mm-hmm. week, and he's in neuroscience, and his GPA is off the charts for that degree, which is obviously neuroscience at Princeton's incredibly challenging. And so, if you ask him, you know what is his secret is. And I I think he'd probably tell you, he just simply does what everybody asks of him, you know, which is kind of like a, almost like the army mentality. I I think always related to how he grew up and, but he's like, I always say he's like a coach's dream, but that's the ideal candidate. I think a guy that just goes to class when he's supposed to go to class is always on time. He always does the extra stuff. He, he turns assignments in on time. So he just, he just, does no attitude, no ego, and just, and just produces. And that's, that's probably the mindset. Now, how do you find that? How do you vet that in the recruiting process? I think it's really tricky, but when we, we really try to use him as a great example, we have other guys like that and they talk to these recruits when they come visit. And because the most common question we get is like, wow, how do they balance? You know, that that's the number one question. Everybody asks us that. I said, I don't know. Ask them. I didn't go to school here. I could not have gone to school here. But um, they thousands of athletes do it over the course of many years here at Princeton and other Ivy League schools. So and, and a lot of different sports we have and we have a lot of Olympians in different sports. I mean, a lot of international athletes. So it's they have success. They're able to do it. It's like the old adage. If you want something busy, give it to the, you know, the, the busy person. Right. If you want something done, you know, give it to the busy person. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of the the idea. And um, time management becomes key. But but I don't I don't know if there's a specific way to vet it. Back to your question, Alex. But it, it's a really good one, and that's exactly sort of what we're looking at in our recruiting philosophy. Is how do we identify? Obviously, we know the great tennis players. We know the guys with great academic scores. How do we marry those two? And what's the right fabric to fit our culture? And we we thought we got pretty close so this year, about as good as we've had it um, recently with our ideal culture. Yeah. And I, go ahead, Sue. You know, go go ahead because I, I had a follow up on a different point. So I, I, you talked about mentorship before and how you really enjoy that process. And so I'm just wondering, in terms of when you're coaching a team, right? And I'm I'm referring specifically to Princeton. How do you ensure that your players don't burn out? Uh, how how do you keep track of of their well being and and make sure that you know can you identify when a player is is maybe pushing it a little bit too far or going a little bit too far or there's too much stress uh, in their day to day? So how how do you approach that whole process as a coach? Yeah, I think one of the things that was sort of I don't I forgot who presented it to me on our campus. One of our other coaches shared it with me and and said you know what. If, if they're with you four hours a day, which is like an average, which is really NCAA wise, all you can have them. And that includes the fitness and the tennis and, and that's for any sport. So if they can be with us four hours a day um, in general, what, what, what are they doing the other 20 hours and how productive are they and how efficient is that and how successful are they there? And that could be their personal life or social life or academic life, their sleeping habits or nutrition. So we, we really take a look, kind of a holistic view of all of that. And I think that's really what we're trying to do to make sure they don't burn out. Um, it, it becomes pretty clear. One thing is lack of sleep, I think. Um, so, again, using, you know, Carl as an example, I mean, that guy, he would come in and, you know, he looked like, you know, he probably just threw on some clothes. We were in the early morning, 7.30, and he'd be the first to tell you he doesn't love early mornings. He likes to warm his body up. He does a lot of stretching, and you know, but he was always there, always. And, and But you could just tell, like, wow, he he definitely burned the candle at both ends last night. And, and sometimes you might say, hey, look, you might want to, you know, take today as a half day or, or just go home, get some rest. I think just sometimes less is more. I think sometimes you really do need to recognize that, um, and you don't need to burn them out. I think the coaches that – do that and uh, and maybe obviously there are certain coaches that maybe wouldn't work in the ivy league and and if you don't really understand the rigor and really embrace that um then you'd have some challenges and i think you need to know when to back off and i think you need to know when to push and so they're not taking advantage so so maybe they went to a party and then they didn't turn their assignment or they they didn't work on their research paper or whatever their senior thesis and they and they say hey coach i've got a 
miss half a practice because I got to go do this. Okay, wait a second. Let's see. So sometimes you have to walk <laughs> back and you got to make sure. So yeah, they, some of these like guys can. They're pretty smart too, right? So you got to you got to make sure <laughs> uh, pulling, pulling the wool over your eyes. So, um, but yeah, that can happen. But but also, I kind of feel for them because sometimes, you know, I know that. I, I, well, I was just having this conversation. I'm sure our faculty would hate to hear this, but I, we know what happens. Like sometimes they will skip class to work on another class because they're 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 behind in that class, and that class is maybe in their mind more rigorous, and de- deserves more attention, and they know that maybe there's not a attendance policy in this class. They just skip it, just work on this one. And we were laughing how like most of us, like in my day, like okay, I'll skip a class so I can sleep. And they're like, yeah, that'd be really nice, but we never really skip a class to sleep. It's like <laughs> work on another class. And I was like, wow, that's pretty, pretty interesting. So I think it's just really being in tune with that. And and so what we do, and, and one thing I do a little bit differently, maybe is like, I don't think it's anything cra- crazy. It's just like, um, and I think basketball is very similar to us. And they have about the same number of players. Maybe basketball might carry 15 guys, we'll carry 12, but I think it's, you know, compared to a football team that has maybe 100 players, we can really get, you know, be really personal and intentional with our players. And so I want to check in. I want to touch them every day. In other words, I want to be on court a little bit with them every day, even though, you know, my assistant may take a few guys for the whole practice or I may take some guys. for. But I want to make sure I go up to each guy, say, hey, how are you? How's your day? Whatever it is, how how are classes? How's how's your family? Whatever it may be, just to have that quick interaction make sure they're okay and then during that maybe you kind of see if they're kind of dragging or they're a little maybe facing that burnout you're talking about that you're able to identify that and do something about it got it and 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 looking more you know macro you know you know you've seen college tennis change in front of your eyes throughout your career i'm guessing right so you know one how has it changed from when you first started coaching to now and 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 where do you see it going? The reason why I'm asking is because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has changed when it comes to college athletics as a whole. But uh, tennis, for me, uh, even though it's a very difficult sport and, and it, you know, one of the most popular sports in the world, I feel like college tennis doesn't have that uh, that level of popularity that maybe it could. Um, so if you if you had the reins and, and you controlled college tennis, you know, what do you what do you think are some things that that uh, that we can do to to help push the sport forward? Well, yeah, that's that's a lot to unpack there. I mean, that, first of all, it's changed um, going back to what you said initially. Um, uh, since I played, you know, I, I go back and, and and Coach Jackson, my coach would laugh at this. And so my teammates, I mean, we there is a big pony sponsorship in college athletics and this is before you know there were no power fives when i played there was you know i was at mississippi state which was which is of course a power five it's in the very powerful sec but um you know they didn't we didn't have a great budget we had we got our uniforms and they were pony shirts but the pony was written in green and so were the collars and we were like a maroon and white school so we we didn't have our the correct colors we had plenty of gear but it just wasn't even the right gear. I think we were, I don't know, we were sort of a second class citizen back then. And you look at what kids have now. And obviously we would travel in a, you know, a 15 passenger van with all of us, maybe eight players and two coaches and just, you know, finding space to sleep and go eight hours. And that's changed. And that's changed for the better. And I think, um, I think women's sports have changed, which has been really good to see as, as you guys know. I mean, it, it's like, and I think that pushed the men's non-revenue sport. Now I think it's also reached kind of getting more to where we are currently where I don't know if we reached for non-revenue sports. And I hate to say this, but a, a, a golden era of college athletics, because now what you're seeing is this real separation. And, and of course the, the power five schools will have, the resources, but we know where the money's coming from. And of course, COVID sort of freaked everybody out. I think a lot of athletic administrators um, sort of started, um, you know, pulling the ripcord, so to speak. I mean, they started really, um, you know, worried, worrying about like the revenues coming forward. Uh, I think we made it through for the most part. And, but I'll worry about the finances of college athletics and where it's going. I mean, and you kind of mentioned like the state of it today and kind of talked about NIL name, image and likeness has come available. That's better for athletes, but I still think funding um, 
you know, the non-revenue sports and, and now men's sports have started, you've seen a lot be cut. I mean, it was really, I, I think it's horrible that Minnesota and Iowa men's tennis were cut as, as long as some other sports there uh, during the pandemic and pen, the, you know, COVID was used sort of as an excuse. Um, but that's, you know, to me, that wasn't really the reason. I think there's ways to work through the Title IX issues there. So that's that's sort of another, I guess, issue um, what we have to deal with in college athletics. But but again, that goes back, and we always talk about this in the ITA, and all college coaches should be relevant in your community, building a fan base. Um, I feel really good in the Ivy because, you know, a lot of what we do is endowed. A lot We do raise a lot of money to support our programs. Not having scholarships, obviously, you can see how that's a budget out and we don't have to worry about, which actually – helps us um so we just kind of focus on our operating and our travel budget and equipment budget for our athletes but um yeah i mean a lot's a lot's changing going forward and we worry about the separation of the the premier conferences the premier schools and is that going to really severely impact the uh in a negative way the the mid-majors who are, are there's a lot of great mid-majors in tennis so um yeah there's a lot going on there um so i don't know if i answered it but i guess you said what I would do if I had the reins, you know, I am on the ITA board, so I, I play a role. So I'm probably responsible for not as popular. I guess I'm a small piece of the pie. And we do have these discussions, um, Steve. And, um, you know, I think obviously we changed the format a few years ago. I think it's been successful. I know we had a lot of pushback. I mean, but I, I, I can tell you this from all my years experience. It's one of the probably the sore spots is like when you get in a room with a bunch of tennis coaches, um, you've got a lot of different opinions. It, because it's an individual sport, I think people have are very, uh, they're good critical thinkers, but they also are highly opinionated. And there's, there, I mean, the format discussion went on for several years almost. And, and it really was amazing the number of ideas put forward and nobody could really agree on anything. And that's been my experience. And that's the unfortunate thing. But that happens in a lot today with, with politics, the way we are in America. Everybody's got opinions with social media. There's a lot driving that. So we were aware of that. But I think the idea was to shorten matches to get on TV. Now, TV, what is that today? You know, I have a TV here in my, my living room at home, but am I streaming on it or am I actually watching cable? You know, there's a big difference. And now I think that's changed. And I think now when we talk about TV and programming, do we really need that space? And it'd be great to be on Tennis Channel, and we have, but but really, is it just a um, a platform for streaming? Because everybody's streaming nowadays, right? Especially with device, it's only going to go more that way. So perhaps that's the avenue we need to attack. And I think we are. The, this Tennis One app, I was just, before we came on tonight, I was just watching the matches in the NCAA. I'm sure you guys were following some, and that's been a great app. So if something like that, the way we can drive more, um, you know, um, popularity, drive more uh, people coming to, to our, our space and watching. I think the more players we have, like Cam Norrie most recently, uh, obviously Kevin Anderson just retired. We got John Isner there, Steve Johnson. I mean, great, great guys that play college tennis, the Bryan brothers. The more guys like that we put out there on the pro circuit, because tennis internationally has an incredible following, we, we need them following college tennis. Um, and so maybe the rivalries are, are big, whether it's Harvard versus Princeton, Alabama versus Auburn, Michigan versus Ohio State, whatever those rivalries are, driving that um, and, and being more popular with that. But I, I think the access, I think having six courts is probably the biggest challenge when you have singles and you, which court are you going to to find that pivotal moment? And you have to really kind of know what you're doing in college tennis to know that dramatic moment and where to look for it on the scoreboard. And so we have to help ourselves promoting it that way. Um, but I think the streaming and what some of these guys, like you, what you guys are doing with this, what like Alex Gruskin and crack rackets is doing. I mean, he's probably been so responsible and like Colette Lewis, uh, Parsa, all the, all these, all these people that are on social media that I think are, that's the future. I mean, let's be honest so where we love or, or don't love social media, it's really a driving sports in, in athletics. And it can be, especially for maybe the underserved sports and, and get them um, more popularity and viewership. I'm, I'm just curious because you talked about those like highlight moments and, and picking and choosing. Uh, Cause like you said, we're working with six courts. How, 
because I'm I always try to wrap my head around this. How do we highlight that specifically, like those big moments? Because as a tennis player, like as a college tennis player, when I'm playing the match, I know exactly where to look, right? I know if Stevens, you know, 40, 15 up, and he's about to, you know, take that first set as he always does before he gasses out in the second set. I know, I know, you know, I know to go watch, to go, to, to go check, you know, to go support, but most, uh, most tennis fans or most people who are watching the sport, they don't understand that. So how do we, how do you think we can highlight those, those moments, those highlight moments, those crucial, you know, nail biters where, where people can derive that entertainment? Yeah, well, maybe it, you know, I think if you get people coming more often, they will understand it naturally. I think simple stuff, and this is really simple, but I see people do this differently all the time, is you'll have really top programs have their courts are numbered and they don't correspond to the scoreboard. Now that's that's not helping our sport, in my opinion. I mean, we have to we have to line that up, right? Because if you're now, even if I'm a college coach watching a match uh, that I'm not involved with and I'm trying to see who's on what court. That's, that's really tricky. I think we need to do a better job of that. And maybe it's, you know, I think we're building a new facility right now at Princeton. It's, it's going to be a state of the art, uh, nine indoor, 12 outdoor. And we're going to, and one thing I want is like, besides the master scoreboard, I want to have individual scoreboards on every court. Um, because I think that's really helpful. If you think about it, as simple as that is, you these smaller scoreboards that are digital, but um, there's one on the corner, and then you could still match it up with the um, the master scoreboard as well. So I think that's something uh, something people could invest in. Um, the streaming is something that almost most top programs are investing. I know it's a little bit more challenging for the the smaller programs with a um, a smaller budget, but I think that's essential to have the streaming now taking that a step further to your point, Alex, I think what uh, it was out, it was Gruskin and, um, and my friend Mark Bay, who, who does an incredible job of commentating. He's one of the, the guys that really knows all the personalities and of the coaches and players in college tennis. Um, and he's doing a lot of uh, broadcast with college tennis and they did a great job at um, the national indoors this year, where it's like red zone type coverage and they're going back and forth. And, um, and, and, and I think, uh, Alex Gruskin does offer something where you can um, bring them in for not not an incredibly high amount. And I know that wouldn't be every match, but maybe every now and then more programs do this. And that's going to drive a lot more interest. Um, so so that's probably without commentators, it's hard to know that dramatic moment, which you might know it when um, Steve is serving for the match. Um, but with commentators, obviously, um, it's a lot easier. Maybe it's getting ambassadors in the crowd to move around and, and your, maybe your extra players to, to inform the fans, you know, and, and try to have more um, things, you know, I think it's maybe there's a, um, you know, how like uh, you can scan um, like a menu, you scan a menu of, you know, what's going on in today's match because nobody wants a piece of paper anymore. I don't think, and they just blow around. Right. We used to hand out kind of the format and maybe, you know, the, then introducing our team, whatever it is, that's, you know, I don't think anybody wants to deal with paper anymore. Right. So um, maybe it's something we can scan when you walk into the facility that would have all the information, including the format, maybe some highlight videos, but also what to look for in the match. And then you can follow the match through that as well. So just some spitballing ideas there, but these are things we've thought about um, that I think it's a challenge with the six course, but I think there's ways we, we are sort of looking at attacking it. That's a very good point. Um, Coach, we want to be respectful of your time because, you know, we're, we're, we're basically approaching that hour mark. Final question for you. Uh, a good percentage of our viewership are, you know, high school tennis players or players that are looking to enter college tennis. Um, so, you know, if they can get a piece of advice from the legendary Coach Billy Pate, <laughs> what would that be? Well, <laughs> that's, that's great. I I um I would tell anybody there's – there's, I've, I've done a lot of camps in the summer, like, you know, recruiting camps. And, and one thing I always say is there's, there's a place to play college tennis. There's a thousand college tennis programs. So there's a place. And, and I think a lot of the, especially the American kids, they sort of get caught up on what they see on TV. And you, you get, if you're, you know, if you're in the South, you grew up, so maybe you like Alabama or Georgia and these football rugby because you see that. And that becomes sort of your dream school. And then, you know, the kids that grew up with a, with a really serious academic um, background at home. Maybe their parents are like, yeah, you've got to go Ivy league. And, 
And I think they have all these preconceived ideas about where they should go or shouldn't go. And, and I think you got to sort of to, to a point, throw that out and really cast a wide net, particularly it depends on your level. I think UTR has been incredible for their sort of when UTR was and, and Dave Fish, by the way, who was, like I mentioned, a long time Harvard coach, he was he was a big catalyst in the early stages of UTR. And he saw the vision of how it could be level based play versus um, age based play. You know, in America, we're, we're so stuck on this age based play. And, and, and in France, particularly, you know, they've got a great league and there's been so many great French players on the tour and college tennis, whatever. But it's it's like it's like you talk about the mentoring. You have a 15 year old um, boy or girl at their club. Maybe they're playing in their French league um, against a 26 year old who just came from the tour. Um, and then you see that's really important. The different game styles they play against. Um, I think that's something you the UTR has really helped. Um, the college fit, there's a feature on there that a lot of people don't know about where you can put your UTR in, uh, whatever that level is, and you can match it up for division one schools and see if you fit in the top six. Um, and granted, maybe you're, you're just outside the top six, but that's pretty encouraging for somebody in high school. That's only a year away. Um, so I think being realistic about it, understanding and really doing the research, look, the research is out there. I mean, the, the information's out there with the internet today, there's so much. And I think, a lot of people are just, they get a little bit, um, either they don't know, or maybe they're a little bit lazy and they just don't want to invest in the time. They want somebody to tell them and they can invest the time and energy through seeing. And sometimes they just don't want to hear, well, I can't go to this school, but they could go to a lot of a different schools. So I think playing college tennis is is really important if you have a passion for college, for tennis. And I hate to see kids um, dream of playing tennis further and in high school or junior tennis when they go to college and, and look, the club teams are great. I mean, there's a lot of club teams around the country, just about every, every college and university in the country. But I think playing varsity tennis, as you guys have done, I mean, there's nothing like it to be on a team. It's an individual sport that is really actually lonely in, in juniors. A lot of people will tell you that it's probably the junior tennis and parents certainly, I don't think they love it. You know, all the stress. I, as soon as you see these kids transition from junior tennis to pro up to, sorry, to college tennis, I mean, it's night and day, the support you get. Obviously, even if you're a walk-on, you're getting all to travel, you get all this equipment. Um, so I think for all those high school kids out there, just finding finding the right fit. And the fit is really important. And I know it may seem vast, but once you start talking to coaches, once you start emailing coaches and you start to really investigate what could be a, a good fit for you, I think you start to get some feedback that makes sense. And then I think you can find a home. And but I, again, I think whether you're a you know a four or five UTR boy and a, or a you know like a, a twelve to thirteen that's playing a high division one, I mean anything everything in between. There's there's places uh, everybody can play. Absolutely, Coach Pate. Thank you, sir. It's an honor having you on on the Just Left podcast. Uh, it was a pleasure, and we really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. you guys. Have a great rest of the weekend, and I really appreciate what you do for for tennis and uh, certainly having me on and talk a little bit about college tennis. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you very much guys. Like comment, subscribe, um, stay healthy, stay happy. And as always just slap. Take care, everybody.